On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about dealing with acute and chronic hamstring strains. What's the difference? What do we do differently in the chronic phase? And what are some of the key tactics that you can also incorporate? The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. I am here with the crew at Champion PT and Performance answering your questions about physical therapy, fitness, sports performance, business, career advice, anything you guys want. If you have more questions, be sure to go to MikeReynolds.com, click on that podcast link and fill out that nice little form. Keep asking away. We're still getting so many questions. It's amazing. I mean, I, I, at the beginning, I was deleting questions after we answered them to like keep track, but I should see how many questions we have. We definitely have over a thousand questions over the years, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, millions kind of, of cr- questions. Some of them are just not, um, as, as they say in baseball now, they're non-competitive pitches. Or we'll just say they're just not there. <laughs> but but, but most of, the, most of the, the, the questions are, are awesome. It's just hard to get to them all. So anyway, I am joined by the, by the crew here. We got, let me see, let's go Dave Tilly, Lisa Russell, Dan Pope, Mike Scaduto, Dewesh Podell, and Lenny Macrina all joining us on the show today. So good representation. Our PT crew that does a lot of our performance training and Dewesh that does more of our stuff out in the gym. So hopefully we can answer this question um, uh, quite well. So let's see. Trevor from Washington asks, hey, everyone, what changes in your treatment are you doing between a chronic versus an acute hamstring strain? Uh, I thought this was an interesting question, right? I I mean, it's interesting, right? Because sometimes you have acute, sometimes you have chronic, sometimes you have acute on chronic, right? And there's a little bit of a difference between these here. So, ah, man, let's see. Acute versus chronic hamstring strain. We know the number one predetermining factor of a hamstring strain is a previous hamstring strain, which by the way is like, that's not a fair fight that everybody always says that like we're looking for more physical type things, but everybody knows that if you get in a hamstring strain strain, something's going on for some reason, either with your physical capacity or maybe your workload capacity or whatever it may be, the activities that you do that you, you end up uh, tending to have some chronic hamstring issues. So I don't know, why don't we start with this, right? So clearly the difference between acute and chronic is probably how fast we go at the beginning. But why don't we start in reverse and let's start talking about chronic hamstring strains and then maybe some things that we can tweak for acute. So I know everybody here has dealt with chronic hamstring strains um, with some of our clients. Uh, Maybe we can get maybe Dan or I don't know, maybe Dave or somebody to kind of start off this conversation. But I know you guys have put a lot of thought uh, and research into the literature on what's best for these chronic tendinopathies. I would love to hear maybe, maybe Dan, I don't know. I don't want to put you a spotlight on you, but like maybe kind of hear your, your thoughts on where we are with chronic hamstring or really other things, but chronic hamstring strains. Yeah, I guess it, um, we have to think about the diagnosis. I mean, are, what is a chronic strain injury? Does that mean that we have a tendinopathy of the hamstring, you know? Um, if we have a chronic person who strains, is that someone who just strains, 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 strains repeatedly and never fully rehabilitates, you know, um, I guess from the standpoint of chronic, we're thinking of it's a true tendon problem. Um, there's two things to think about. So for one, we're going to get stress on that hamstring tendon just from contracting. Right. But the other element they think is a little bit different is if it's truly on that tendon, you might get some compressive loads as a tendon attaches to ischial tuberosity. Uh, so those folks oftentimes won't handle things like sitting well. I know it sounds kind of silly, but if you sit on that tendon for a long period of time, it bugs you. Uh, and if you combine hip flexion with the contraction of the hamstring, it also tends to bother these folks as well. You know, And I do think that even in a, a regular strain injury, so if, let's say if I injure the muscle belly, uh, if you combine hip flexion, so stretching the hamstring 
with contracting at the same time, that's still something that's going to aggravate some with a strain injury, probably above just contracting the muscle. Uh, but with a, a tendinopathy, I think that's, it's a little bit different mechanism, right? Um, the other piece is that generally speaking with a strain injury, we're thinking, you know, a couple days for the scar to start, right? So one or two days of really unloading the tendon, maybe some isometrics or very light activity. And we're starting to ramp things up slowly until about, I don't know, seven to 10 days when that scar gets stronger. And then we start to progress forward. Uh, with a tendinopathy, it's, it's something different. It's, it's a chronic injury. Uh, we probably have some pathological changes in the tissue, and we're trying to manage that by getting stronger, unloading initially, and then just ramping our way back up over the course of time. Um, so they're, they're really treated a little bit differently from that standpoint, but they're, they're similar as well. Um, I find myself rambling at this point, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and let someone else take a I take a Yeah, rambling but because you know it's a big topic right it's a big topic to answer in in a little conversation like this but i think i think you did a good job like outlining here like what is chronic like is chronic somebody that has like you know acute strains several times or is this a chronic tendinopathy of, of somebody that's not kind of healing up that never even returned back to normal uh you know that sort of thing i my guess is based on the question it's like more of the recurring hamstring strain um, and that's kind of one I want, why I wanted to talk about chronic because maybe sometimes like we get an acute hamstring strain and then we kind of get them back, but then we don't address anything to maybe get them over the hump so they don't have it again. Right. So it's, if we kind of talk about chronic, I think we can, we can really then lead into what we do acute, but Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I think, um, I think Dan and I are a really good example of different types of maybe what looks the same on the surface level. I remember reading a paper and I can't remember off the top of my head, but they talked a lot about progressions of hamstring strains rehab. And they, they were the first paper that I saw to really differentiate the like capacity based chronic hamstring injury versus like the range of motion or extended, you know, um, lengthening type injury. And that was really helpful for me because the, the hamstring strains that I see are very much not like straight up force overload, but they're more about range of motion overload. So I think when you're thinking about someone who maybe is chronically dealing with, uh, an injury or they continue to have problems, you have to think about what the, the limiting stress factor is, right? Is this like someone who's squatting super heavy or sprinting super fast or is lifting really heavy? That's definitely like a force overload versus in my world, dancers, gymnasts, cheerleaders, I treat a lot of people who have those issues. It's definitely more of a range of motion issue. Like they're so far into their end ranges of motion so consistently that when they contract at end range, that's when they have issues. Like, like the gymnasts that I work with, they have some discomfort with sprinting, with jumping, but definitely like extreme motion is that. So like the last 20% of our rehab is like very high level aggressive on the range of motion, like eccentric end range coupling versus if I'm treating someone maybe who's on a lifting, I'm thinking about more progressive load from like more of what I take from Dan, which is more the actual prescription of squatting and sprinting. And I think Tim Gabbett's research has said that more time in high, um, high end sprinting is actually protective against hamstring strains if you train it properly with your workload. So I think it's really important people remember that it's not always about just getting somebody back to sprinting. That's a, that's a great point too. And again, maybe why we struggle with some, some things is we're just blindly calling everything a hamstring strain where the mechanism of injury can be quite different. Um, you know, I know in baseball, believe it or not, hamstrings are, are one of the top two injuries we see other than pitching injuries because those guys are knuckleheads. But uh, like in terms of that, it's hamstrings and obliques, right? And it's them sprinting to first. You know, it's almost like every time them sprinting to first. So it's, it's you know, who would think like in a sport where you literally just stand around for 45 minutes and then sprint once like that, you would be prone to hamstring strains. It's shocking. Right. But it's, it's a completely different mechanism for them. They probably have poor sprint capacity, probably poor eccentric capacity, maybe some muscle imbalances, lumbopelvic, you know, that we see differences. We measure everybody's hamstring strength profiles left and right using a nor board from vald right like we use like their 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 um, machines so they can kind of tell us those differences but um but super interesting so assuming that we now have some thoughts right we have identify what the mechanism mechanism is dave talked about the elongation type mechanism and making sure that we have strength stability and some eccentric control at end range i think that's a really good example i think dan talked a little bit more about like the overload concept a little bit right so i think that's the type of person if you have chronic tendinopathy we start switching to different things like more aggressive eccentric training and things like that so um anybody want to touch on that i mean i have some of the research on on that and like eccentric training and and, and stuff like that but has, has anybody done anything fresh i feel like i was reading something on fitnesspainfree.com recently but um but uh, uh i i i but i but i could be wrong i mean dan do you i mean do you use eccentrics do you think they're a big part of your rehab program for chronic tendinopathy like what have you been doing 
Yeah, um, at least from the tendinopathy literature I've read over the course of time, I think um, as a profession, we get really into one research paper that says isometrics and then concentric, eccentrics. And I think what we're finding over the course of time is they all work pretty similarly. And I think the other thing is that we have to prepare athletes for what they're getting back to. You know what I mean? Um, I tend to see, and it sounds kind of silly, but I see a lot of chronic tendinopathy issues from people deadlifting a lot. You know, they do a ton of hinge patterns as end range. Um, and that's going to be completely different than a sprinter, right? And I'm not going to treat that person the same way. So um, if someone's having trouble from a loading perspective, from a deadlift perspective, I have to slowly dose that back up. Whereas if someone's having trouble with sprinting, it's a completely different movement. The loads are much smaller and they have to be done much more quickly. It's more plyometric in nature. So I think that um, generally speaking for me, I don't know if one type of contraction is better than the other, you know? Um, but what it will do is meet the athlete where they are and start to progress them to where they need to be over the course of time. And whether that's with some eccentric training or that's with concentric, or if I can get them to do plyometric stuff right off the bat, they're trying to get back to some sprint training. Uh, I'll try to, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, and I like, again, you, I think really you and Dave so far have said this really well, like it's, uh, you have to identify what's going on with the person in front of you and not treat everybody the same. I like that. So Len, what do you think? Yeah. I want to pose this to the group because I, I I'm Ooh. trying to think about it in my head. So how does it affect you guys? It seems like we're talking a lot about tendinopathy. What, a, what about proximal versus distal? And what about mid muscle, like muscle belly? How is that affecting you guys in, let's, let's say the chronic, like the end range, the end stage rehab is, is, are we doing things differently or no? Can I, can I ask a clarification question on that? Yes. Do we get chronic mid belly strains? I would say, why not? I, I guess it's, it's how we define chronic. You get I scarring guess. in the area maybe, and then yeah. you, you either restrain it or you perceive that you restrain it. Maybe it's scarring that's, you know, trying yeah. to elongate. I don't know. But yeah, I guess how would uh, proximal versus distal, especially. Uh, yeah, yes, Dave. I'd yeah. like to ask Lenny <laughs> McCrina show now. But. <laughs> no, it's good. I, 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 I mean, I, I like it though, because I, I think, again, I think we're highlighting right here that the definition of chronic isn't completely yeah. right. If mm. chronic meaning like you've had the same symptoms, it's not getting better for six months, or you've had four acute strains within a six month period. Right. Like, I think that's a right. big, big difference. So, uh, so, but I, but I like your, I like the, the question and stuff. So proximal distal too. I mean, you know, yeah. Dave, I think you wanted yeah. to jump in. Yeah. That's a good point. And the only two cents I'm going to throw in is because I treat a lot of kids that are under 18. And I think for me, it's like, when it's someone who's over 18 or like over 16 and they're through puberty, it's like, a, hmm, can we like push the load a little bit proximally? If someone's youth, you should not be pushing the um, proximal hamstrings because that's a bony interface problem. That's a growth plate injury. And that's like, yeah. I've seen a lot of people come to champion after two, three therapists where they just tried to like use eccentric training and use overloads in a kid who has like a growth plate injury. And it's like, whoa, that's just like, it's like a hard six weeks of like, you need to let that heal. So that's just yeah. my just don't do that. That's actually like way more than two cents. That was way more valuable than that. Cause it, I think you're right. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of people will do that. Right. Because again, they're treating all hamstring strains the same, but I think that's a really good point too. And, and one of the first things I'm always concerned about with the hamstring train is do they have some sort of like apophysitis? Yeah. Do they have some sort of like large interaction? Yeah. Uh, what do you think Pope? I feel like I'm talking too much, but uh, I mentioned this I earlier. It. If someone has a very proximal injury on the tendon, we're probably going to be thinking more about handling compressive loads, you know, uh, especially early on. So if someone has, I don't know, an injury closer to the muscle belly, maybe they just don't handle, uh, excuse me, maybe they handle um, stretching a little bit better. So if I'm contracting the muscle in a lengthened state, they may handle that a bit better. Whereas someone who has a very proximal injury right on the tendon where it's right on the ischial tuberosity, they may not handle those as well. So we might not be able to throw as much end range stuff. I mean, a good example is those folks may not be able to handle something like a single legged deadlift very well, even though that's a rehab exercise we'd love to throw at them. Maybe we have to do more, um, I don't know, prone hamstring curls, something where the, the hamstring is not uh, stretched while we're strengthening it. And then over the course of time, obviously, we need to get back to that compressive load. But early on, um, you may aggravate that area, um, especially if you're dealing with a tendon issue, which may be getting too much stress already. So makes sense. Makes sense. And, you know, and, and I wanted to touch upon a little bit of the literature too on like eccentrics and stuff like that, because that's a, that's a hot topic. And you can find an article that like makes you think like, oh, this is what I have to do going forward, where that's not always 
fair for the person in front of you because they, they're you know, different people. But I, if I look at the evolution of treatment for tendinopathy, especially like an, a hamstring type strain, something like that, it went from concentric to eccentric to isometric to now, I think we're calling it slow load or something like that. Like if you actually look in the literature, which is really kind of funny if you break down this evolution in there. I think the reason why eccentrics were superior to concentrics is because people were literally doing a hamstring curl with a three pound weight, right? So it wasn't necessarily that the concentric weight itself was inappropriate. It was this, the exercise selection probably was. All of a sudden now we jump to eccentrics and it's putting tremendous stress and force on the muscle in, a, in an excellent way, in a way that we want. That's going to help strengthen it. That's going to help build some resilience. It, it was amazing. Um, around the same time, we started doing those heavy isometrics, which again, same thing. You're putting a ton of tension through the tissue, right? I think you can find some articles that uh, the original article always shows isometrics are amazing. Then the rest of the articles say, well, they're about the same as eccentrics, right? And now we're getting to slow load. Right. So slow load now, which I essentially is just a slow eccentric followed by a slow concentric, right? It's finally we've put it all together and just realized that maybe we, again, it's not about picking. It's about just doing the exercise as well. Right. So it's about loading the tissue. So, uh, Dan, what do you think? Yeah. Sorry. Again, talking a lot, but I think a lot of this research too is just in the patellar tendon, right? Or the Achilles tendon and these studies on the isometrics are beneficial in the patellar tendon, but not in the Achilles. So it's, um, we're trying to take this information and apply it to every tendon in the body and not every tendon behaves the same way. Um, so it's certainly not fair to cherry pick these articles and say, this is how another tendon behaves, especially when we have additional research to show that different people respond differently in different areas. So Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. So just be careful what you read. You can find like one article that says, Hey, Oh man, I got to be doing isometrics. That is now the key to tendinopathy that I never thought of before. Right. Um, it's probably not that simple. So, um, I, you know, just, just cause we're going over a little bit. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll summarize the acute real quickly. The acute's the same concept there. Our whole goal with the acute is to know everything we just talked about the last 15 minutes. So that that's your end game. That's your end result. That's what we're getting to. So that's the goal of your acute. At the beginning, we just got to be really cautious as that tissue is healing. A lot of times people go too fast in the very, very early acute stage and not get a lot of healing going on. And then they struggle when they get subacute or they start running again, that they kind of feel like they have recurring hamstrings or it's just not going away. It's probably because you didn't, you didn't let it heal enough at the beginning. So we're pretty cautious with stretching. We're pretty cautious with elongation elongating the muscle group. We're pretty cautious. We're putting too much um, tension through it at the beginning phases of that. But you can see why this gets tricky now. If the acute phase, we're super cautious about putting stress on the muscle, but then the reason why they keep getting hurt is because we're not putting enough stress on the muscle, you see our issue, right? So the key to putting all this together, acute versus chronic, is making sure that we're doing both ends of that spectrum. We're not going too fast at the beginning, but we're not going too slow at the end. Is that a good kind of summary, I guess? So hopefully that helps. We could talk about this for hours. I know Mike Scaduto is itching to play another pre-recorded <laughs> message, but we, um, um, we're, you know, we, we'll get there. But I, I, I think that is a good, that is a good place to start for most people when they're, when they're dealing with these chronic injuries is some of the big points here. So what I want you to do is next time you get somebody that's right in front of you, I want you to think about all the great things that Dan, Dave, Lenny, everybody else said is like, think about those, those concepts here and say, what is this person in front of me? How did they get here? Why did they get here? What is different about this one? And then pick what you do based on that. Does that make sense? So, Hopefully you enjoyed another good episode. I know this was a, this is a good one. The more Dan Pope talks, the more we all learn. So we love it, Dan. Keep going. <laughs> um, but good episode always. You guys are you guys are great. We always learn from each other from these episodes. So uh, appreciate it. Be sure to head to iTunes, Spotify, rate, review, subscribe. And if you have more questions like this, just head to the website, click on that podcast link, and fill out the form, and we'll keep answering away. See you on the next episode. <laughs>